Well, I always struggle with expectations during the Advent season. I purchase every year our Advent family devotional, and I have visions of grandeur in my mind of how beautiful and spiritual our times in the Word will be as a family. I see pictures on social media of these beautiful families reading their Advent devotionals in front of the glowing fire in the background and hot chocolate in their hands. And I think we can do this at the Ferguson home. We can do this. I expect that the children will gather around my feet with adoring looks on their faces saying, Dad, read to us the story of the first Christmas again. And then reality kicks in. One child is climbing on the curtains. Another is bouncing off the couch. Another won't get off their phone. I'm worn out from a long day at work. I don't feel like reading anything to anyone. I end up screaming at the children about the love and peace of Jesus. <laughs> You're laughing because you've been there. Amen. You've been there. And I'm saying, how come we don't have the love and peace of Jesus? Why can't we be a normal family? I would sit down for 10 minutes and do a devotional. Instead of a picture of tranquility and peace, our family time turns into a dramatic rendering of why Jesus had to come save us in the first place. Amen. Does anybody else struggle with unmet expectations? Expectations are so powerful in marriage. We have a whole session in Reengage our marriage ministry on how to deal with unmet and unspoken expectations. Because if we're honest, we all have expectations. Barry and I often say one of the most dangerous elements in our marriage is when one of us wakes up in the morning with a set of expectations that we don't articulate to one another. Because then we don't realize why our spouse is so frustrated by our plans for the day. And if we've learned anything in 2020, is that we should hold all of our expectations lightly. Does anybody remember the two week shutdown in March we said would be the end of the pandemic? And then life will go back to normal. That all seems so long ago, nine months ago, y'all. And now we're living through some of the most challenging days of the pandemic so far. It's testing our perseverance, our joy, and our faith. But the Lord wants us to remember that in the midst of the unexpected is where he does some of his most powerful work in our lives. Let me say that again. Just think about that statement. It's in the midst of the unexpected that he does some of the most powerful work in our lives. Why? Because if things go according to our plans, we seldom look to him. We seldom look to him. But when our plans are disrupted and our expectations unmet, we all of a sudden see the foolishness of trusting in our own wisdom and we begin to see things we hadn't seen before. We're calling this Advent season the Christmas we didn't expect. It obviously fits our experience in 2020, but also speaks to something deeper. Not only is this Christmas different than we expected, but the first Christmas was different than we expected. Last week, Pastor Logan shared with us about the unexpected timing of the first Christmas. Jesus arrived on God's timeline, not ours, and so we learn that one of the keys to walking with God in any season of life is learning to wait on him. His timing is not our timing, and so one of the disciplines of the Christian life, we don't like to say this, but it's true, is patience, is learning to wait on God. This morning, we want to talk about another part of the unexpected nature of Christmas, and that's the unexpected nature of the king himself. Because when Jesus came to the earth, the people of Israel had been waiting for a king. 
They had been waiting for a deliverer, amen? They had expectations on what their Messiah would look like, what their king would do. They had something very specific in mind. God, when are you gonna send the military general that will lead the people to victory over the Romans in battle and restore the kingdom of Israel to their homeland? That's what they expected. But that's not how the Messiah came in his first advent. He came completely unexpectedly. Not just when he came, but how he came. He came to show us a better way. Will you open your Bibles with me this morning to Philippians 2? We're going to read together verses 5 through 8 and learn about how unexpected Christ was and how unexpected he is even to us today. Will y'all stand with me in the room, or if you're at home, stand also in the honor of reading God's word. This is God's word to us together today. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Pray with me. Lord, help us to understand what this scripture means so that we can have the same attitude in us that was in Christ Jesus. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Today we want to talk about the expected king. What were they looking for? What do we expect a king to look like and act like? And then we want to contrast that with the unexpected Christ as we read about in this passage in Philippians 2. And then once we get our arms around who Jesus was and is, then we want to take a look at our own lives and say, are we an unexpected Christian? Let's start, though, by talking about what our expectations are for those who rule over us. Jesus himself described the way that worldly kings rule over their people in Matthew 20, verse 25. I encourage you to write that verse down and read it later. Jesus said this way, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions Act as tyrants over them. Jesus was saying that rulers in this world, those in positions of power and authority, prestige, fame, they function in a certain way. We're all used to this. We are familiar with it. This is why when I read that verse to you from Matthew 20, you don't all go, what? What is Jesus talking about? That's so crazy. Because we all are familiar with it. We see it all the time. Jesus said, rulers in this world lord it over others and they act as tyrants. So when the Messiah came into the world, there was a framework for kings that had set their expectations. What was that grid? What did they expect kings and rulers to do? Well, first they expected that a king would exploit position for personal gain. The CSB translates the word harpagmos in this passage as exploited. It comes from a word in Greek that means to grasp something by force. Exploit is an interesting translation. Many of the older English translations would say that um, he did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped or held firmly to. But exploit is a good English translation that gets to the heart of the way worldly rulers use their position. They plunder from those under them for their own personal reward. How does that happen? 
because they have the power in their position to take things by force, which is what this word means. We're all familiar with how this works in the world. We expect benefits and perks and resources within an organization, a business, or a government to flow to the top. We expect those in positions of power to use their power and their position to exploit those under them for personal gain, for wealth, for fame, and personal reward. This is the lorded over leadership that Jesus says marks the kingdom of this world. The second thing we expect in a king is they maintain their distance from their subjects. We expect that royalty does not mix with commoners. Now, we don't have royalty by birth in America, even though we see that in other parts of the world. We're fascinated by it. <laughs> we have royalty here by fame and wealth and power, but it works the same way. There's distance. We call it the VIP section. There's distance between the VIPs and the normal people. So it makes sense that we would expect that a king would maintain his distance from his subjects. Born in a palace, surrounded by servants, kept in seclusion so as not to be soiled by the common man. Given a military escort to protect his safety. Roped off from men and women who might crowd in close to him, getting too close to royalty. We expect the king to keep his distance from his subjects. The third thing we expect of a king is an arrogant attitude. Arrogance is par for the course in worldly leadership. It's not just that we expect leaders to act and live a certain way, but that leaders themselves expect to be treated a certain way. It's that there's a condition of the heart called pride that fills a person with arrogance. And it's often connected with positions of power and privilege. Because we say things like, oh, power goes to your head, right? With that position or with that privilege, that person thinks they're more important than they really are. We begin to think when we find ourselves in that situation that other people exist to serve us. Now, arrogance and pride can trip up any human being, but they are especially dangerous for those that are in charge because we can begin to think too highly of ourselves. We all know these kinds of rulers. We've all been these kinds of rulers. And so we expect that when the king of kings, the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one, when he would come, he would follow suit. He would be like all the other rulers and kings that we've ever seen. He would exploit people, maintain distance, full of arrogance. But Christmas brings us an unexpected Christ. Jesus of the New Testament is not like any rulers we've ever seen or heard of or known personally. What do we see about him based on Philippians 2, 5 through 8? Well, first of all, he used his position to bless others, right? He used his privilege, his power, his wealth, his resources to bless others. Philippians 2 affirms the full deity of Jesus. Did you see it here? In verse 6, it says, He existed in the form of God did not consider equality with God something to be exploited. So two times in this verse, it describes that Jesus was in the form of God and equal with God. I mean, this is a, not just a king, but this is a divine king. What does he do with that? Jesus doesn't use that position to exploit others. He uses all of that to bless others. Think about this for a minute. King Jesus sees his position, his power, and his place as an opportunity to bless. That's so different than the way we normally think and see. This is not exploitive leadership, but blessing leadership. 
Back to Matthew 20, I I read you verse 25 where Jesus talked about worldly leadership, but listen to the next couple of verses where he describes his leadership and how different it is from the world. Here's what Jesus said. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, listen carefully, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life away as a ransom for many. The Messiah, the King of Kings, did not come to be served. He didn't come to exploit his position for personal gain, but to use his position for our gain. To serve, to bless others with his life and his sacrifice. That's a different kind of king. Second, we read here that Jesus comes near to serve humanity. Rather than being distant from his people, roped off where no one can get near to him, we read in verse 7, it says that he emptied himself and he took on the likeness of humanity. Instead of keeping his distance from us, the king came near to his people Instead of being born in a palace to royal surroundings, Jesus was born in a manger to teenage parents. Instead of separating from the common man, he touched the leper. He healed the broken woman. Instead of staying behind the rope line, he walked through the crowd. In fact, the scripture repeatedly says they crowded in on him so much and they were touching him. He didn't even know who was touching him. He was accessible to all. Full deity wrapped up in full humanity. This is the miracle of what Christians call the incarnation. Now, we often talk about how we are a cross-centered church, that uh, we build our whole philosophy of ministry around the cross. We say like Paul does, we preach Christ and him crucified. But listen to this. The cross means what it means because the manger means what it means. If Jesus isn't full deity in human flesh, then the cross means something completely different. So we need to, as Christians, say this is essential to our faith. What happened at Christmas, what happened on the cross, and what happened at the empty tomb. This all together is what tells us who Jesus is. God came near. What did the prophet Isaiah say his name is? Emmanuel. God with us. This is not what we expected the Messiah to do. We expected that he would come, but he would stay distant from us. He would be up on the mountain and up in the palace and we might be able to get a sight of him from a distance. But no, he came all the way down. All the way down, not just the likeness of humanity, Paul writes, but as a form of a servant. Think about that. Not just that he served, but he came as a servant. Think about that word is doulos in Greek. It's the word for slave. Think about the lowliest person in first century uh, Israel. And And what Paul is saying is Jesus came as that person. He didn't come in the highest place. He came in the lowliest place. He came near to serve. And third, he came with a humble heart. Philippians 2, 8 says, when he came as a man, he humbled himself. Did you see that in verse 8? He humbled himself. To be humble is to put others ahead of yourself. We sometimes misunderstand humility as really thinking really badly about ourselves. We often think about humility as someone who just beats themselves over the head endlessly. That's not humility. That can still be someone who's self-focused. They're just self-focused in a negative way. To be humble is to be others-focused. Not to think too highly of myself, not to think too lowly of myself, just to think rightly about myself, and also to think of others ahead of myself. This is the context of this passage. In fact, the two verses right before this, Philippians 2, 3 and 4, describe Christian humility this way. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, there's the word, 
Consider others as more important than yourself. Everyone should look not to his own interest, but rather to the interest of others. That's what Jesus did when he came. Even though he was more important than us, he put our needs ahead of his own. Even though he was worthy of our service, he served us. The humble heart of Jesus is the most unexpected part of the Christmas story. When you really think about what this passage is saying. He is equal with God. I mean, you guys, you can't get any higher than that. He's equal with God, but lowers himself to die for his people. I don't know about you guys, but kings don't do that. Like as you read history, what you read is kings staying way behind the front lines and sending all the commoners out to die in battle. That's what kings do. And so Jesus comes in, and instead of pushing us to the front of the line, he goes to the front of the line. He lays down his life for his people. He puts our needs ahead of his own. He dies for us. What unexpected humility from the greatest of kings. Philippians 2 is a beautiful meditation on how how the unexpected timing of Christmas brought us an unexpected Christ. But then it asks a powerful question. Are you an unexpected Christian? The truth is that following the way of Jesus will make us unexpected to the world because the way of Jesus is so different. I don't know what (laughs) answer you would give to this question, but I think it's fascinating to think about. How does the world expect Christians to live? What does the world expect followers of Jesus to do? I think most people expect Christians to be self-righteous, judgmental, harsh. But here's Jesus inviting us to follow him in three very different ways. One, that we would be generous. Just as Jesus gave what he had to serve us, here's the question. Will we give what we have to serve others? I'm so thankful to lead a generous congregation. To me, one of the things that marks that a people has been changed by the gospel is they're generous. Because they realize that Jesus gave everything for them, so they should be generous with others. Last Sunday, we announced we had 70 angels from prison fellowship ministry to adopt children of incarcerated men and women that we wanted to buy gifts for as a church. And do you guys know what? All 70 were adopted by the end of the 9 a.m. service, the first service. That's what I'm talking about, City View. Let's not give in to economic fear and uncertainty before us. Let's trust God, continue to be generous people. You don't have to be rich to be generous. You just have to be open-handed with what you have. How's God calling us, calling you to be generous this Christmas? Small, big ways. God, I want to be generous the way Jesus has been generous with me. And when you're generous, it it catches people off guard, doesn't it? It's unexpected. Why are you doing that for me? Why are you giving that to me? Because it's not expected. Second, Jesus calls us to proximity. Just as Jesus comes near to us, will we get close to others? You see, I think that often we want to serve, but just from a safe distance. Think about what this text is saying. Jesus came in the likeness of humanity, in the form of a servant. He came all the way to us. He got close. Remember? He wasn't distant like we expect kings to be. He got into the mess of our lives with us. Now, this is obviously more challenging during COVID, but it's not impossible. We just have to get creative. Here's my concern. Can I be honest with you? Can I shepherd your heart for a minute? Here's my concern. That COVID fears are causing us to stay far away from people in need. 
And so it's very, very tempting during this season to just hole up in our homes and keep our distance, which there's reasons we need to do that, but then to use that as a reason we don't connect with anybody. And Jesus invites us to proximity, to get near, to get close to people where they are in their mess. Now I know, listen, I'm a pastor, I understand. It's messy, it's easier to just stay further away because once you get close, then it's like, gosh, now I'm involved. You know what I mean. Now I'm involved. I thought this was going to be a one-time phone call. That this might be a, just writing a card to somebody. Now I'm involved. But Jesus gets involved with us, right? He doesn't just send us a note from heaven and say, hey, I love you. He comes all the way. He gets close. So the invitation to us is a one to proximity. We have to lean in, even during COVID, even if it's by Zoom, by FaceTime, or a phone call. Consider this question as you leave this service today. Who do I need to check in on during this holiday season? Who do I need to check in on? Maybe I need to make some cookies and drop them off at the front door. Maybe I need to do something a little unique because of this season, but listen carefully. Don't isolate. Don't Stay far removed from people in this time of need. Lean in. We have to do it if we're going to serve. And finally, Jesus invites us to humility. This is about our hearts, our attitude. Do we see other people the way God sees them? Or are we so focused on our needs that we struggle to see the needs of others? This is a hard, hard question to answer honestly this year. Um, I I heard somebody say one time that pain makes us inward focused. That's very true. You know what I'm saying? Like when when you are sick, all you can think about is like the sickness, right? All you can think about is how do I get rid of the sickness? When you're when you're dealing with emotional pain, you you just you kind of turn you fold inward, right? Like how do I deal with this? How do I get healed up from this, right? And there's an important reason we're built like that. Like we do need to get healthy. But then what happens when you have a global pandemic is everybody turns inward at the same time. It's like, oh, this is so stressful, so difficult. Whoosh, we all turn inward. Am I the only one? We're, we're, We're tempted to do that. And so here's Jesus inviting us in this season to not do that. Don't turn inward. Here's the truth. Here's the truth. If you can get this in the front of your mind, it'll really help you. Everybody's facing something hard. Everybody. Your heart may look different. Your pain may be a little different, but everybody's facing something hard. So if every time somebody goes through something hard, they turn inward, nobody's ever going to serve anybody. We, We just won't. So here's the question. Can we see beyond our own struggle and pain and difficulty to see others? Not to ignore our pain and difficulty. I'm not saying that. But just can we see other people's pain, right? You know what I'm saying? Like if you get real focused on your own difficulty, you can't see what other people are going through. So you might run into somebody and they're going through real trauma, but you can't really enter into their trauma because you're, you're real focused on your thing back here. Humility, what does it say in the scripture? What is Philippians 2 humility? Putting others ahead of myself. Not denying what I'm dealing with, but putting the needs of others ahead of my own. Jesus invites us to have a humble heart. So here's the question I think the Lord wants us to meditate on this week. What is your attitude this Christmas? What's your attitude? <laughs> Philippians 2, 5, after I've explained this whole verse to you, look where it starts in verse 5. Adopt the same attitude as Christ Jesus. I'll be honest with you, this word is really convicting. Because I would almost rather just say like, hey, adopt these practices. And be like, sweet, check the box. And then it's like, adopt the attitude? What is the attitude? The word attitude means to... Set your mind in a particular way of thinking. That's what the word underneath this word attitude means. 
to set your mind on a particular way of thinking, like to have a frame of the way you process life in the world, have this attitude. So here's the question. What is your attitude this Christmas? <laughs> I feel like we just ought to sit with that question for a minute. <laughs> what is my attitude? Oh, Lord, help me. Are we focused on what's lost, frustrated on plans that have had to change? Are we, hold on now, this is in the next part of Philippians 2, are we grumbling and complaining? Are we grumbling and complaining instead of giving thanks and praise to God? That's attitude, right? Are we looking inward instead of looking outward? That's attitude. What if all of us were to commit ourselves, we're going to adopt the attitude of Jesus this Christmas? Say, so this is a Christmas unlike anything I've ever been through. Maybe unlike anything I'll ever go through again. But what a great Christmas to test. Can I have the attitude of Jesus in the middle of anything? Can I have the attitude of Jesus in the middle of anything? Can I believe that God's working even in the midst of this mess? That God is with us and he loves us and he's moving even in difficult circumstances? Can we be generous people who give and who serve and are close to the brokenhearted and have a humble heart? Can we have that attitude this year? Lord, give us the attitude of Jesus this Christmas. Will you pray with me? Father, on behalf of the whole City View family, those in the room and those watching online, um, we confess, <laughs> we confess together where our attitude has not been the attitude of Jesus. Father, I confess that I have got into a place of grumbling, complaining, frustrated, selfish. Uh, God, I just I haven't had the attitude of Christ. And so I repent of that this morning. We as a congregation, we repent. We ask you to give us the attitude of Christ, this generous, servant-hearted, humble attitude. Please, Holy Spirit, change us from the inside out. God, thank you for what an incredible body of believers City View is. Thank you that they model so much of this for me, of generosity and service and humility. But God, I pray you protect that spirit during this difficult Christmas. And God, forgive us for looking inward. Help us to see others and what they're going through. For your glory and fame, Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen.